Praise the Lord. Well, we are in a series called Breakthrough, and we've been looking at for the last several weeks this whole topic of praying, praying for breakthrough, seeking God and His power and His might in our life that we can be all that He calls us to be and, and have the strength and the power to, to do that. And my prayer this year is that we would experience all that God has for us, that we would break through individually and we would break through as a church. That's what our prayer time on Friday night's about, between 6.30 and 8.30. And if you can't come for all of it, come for part of it, because it's a very important time to come and pray for breakthrough in our lives and in our church and for the requests that you turn in, for other requests that people have. And then for renewal services with Stephen Manley, and he'll be with us in the morning, the evening, and Monday through Wednesday, and he'll be doing a Bible study over lunchtime on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and invite you to come at noon till 1. If you want to come, just bring your lunch with you, or just come and enjoy God's Word. He'll be available for Sunday school class next week, but, but we want to just inundate ourselves with God's presence and His Word, and invite you to be a part of it. I hope you clear your calendar and, and do that. In our series, we've been looking at the whole issue of asking, seeking, and knocking, of coming to the place where we understand the impact and the importance of prayer, that we not only know about it, but we do it, we live it, we experience it, we're, we're part of it. Today, I want to talk with you about praying for others. We talked about asking God, bringing our knees before Him. We've talked about seeking Him and growing in our faith with Him, but today I want to talk to you about about knocking. And the question is this, is how do we pray for others? How do we, how do we pray for friends or family members or work associates or those people in our life? Let me ask you another question. Do you ever get tired of, of waiting on God to answer your prayers? Do you? I, I have. Have you ever been in a hurry and God wasn't in a hurry? Free? 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 This year I'm encouraging you to read through the Bible and, and I'm reading through the Bible and working through Genesis and into Exodus and and Leviticus and on. And in and, and, and Genesis, there's, it's an amazing book. And there's a Bible reading chart out at the Resource Center that I encourage you to get. And it breaks up the Bible in daily readings that this year you could read through the whole Bible or you want to read just through the Old Testament or New Testament. But letting God's Word soak in. And, and in the, the Bible, the very first book, the book of Genesis, is the beginning of everything. And, and you could say that one of the major themes of the book of Genesis is waiting on God. You think about Abraham, or you think about Adam right up front. Here's Adam, the first man that God created. And, and I think about here's God who created heaven and earth. He created day and night and sky and ground. He created the seas and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and the animals, and he created man. And he said, it's all good. But then he said there was something not good. He said it wasn't good for man to be alone. And so the scripture goes on and, and, and says this. So in Genesis chapter 2, so the man gave, he called all the animals together and he said this. He said, so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And you know the rest of the story. God put Adam to sleep. He, he brought Eve out of, uh, he formed her out of a rib in his side and and. And he formed her into a woman. And, and I always wonder, where did the name woman come from? And my theory is that when Adam saw Eve, he just said, whoa, man. Whoa. I mean, it was good. It was good again. And I wonder how long Adam had to wait. Do you think it was a day? Was it a month? Or maybe it was years. Maybe it was years and years and years that Adam's just kind of tromping around with the horses and the cows and the, and the dogs. And he's just going, man, this is great, but you just, there's something different from you than me. There's, it's just not, it's not suitable, a helper. And then comes Eve, and, 
And Adam was waiting on God. And then I think of later in the book of Genesis, we, we meet Abraham. And Abraham is an amazing story, this, this father of the faith that we would even say that he's our father, that you look back through the lineage and the descendants of, of faith, and there's Abraham. And Abraham was 75 years old when God called him to leave his country, to leave his family, and go to a place that he would show him. I don't know about you, but it just doesn't excite me to think of being 75 years old and God set me out on a new venture. I mean, some of you are there, and to think of packing it all up, starting it all over, and God says, I got a promise for you. Let's go, bucko. And you're going, well, here, let me get my wheelchair, and I'll follow you. And, but here's, here's Abraham. And God says to Abraham, you're going to be a father. He's 75 years old, no kids. And God says, oh, by the way, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky. And Abraham goes, wow, God, that's wonderful. Or, whoa, God, that's, that's wonderful. And, and he waits on God, and he waits on Sarai. And, and when God says, oh, by the way, this next year you're going to have a child, Abraham laughs, and Sarah laughs, because it had been 25 years since God had said that. Abraham is now 100 years old. Sarai, Sarah is 90 years old. And gives birth to Isaac. And Isaac literally means laughter. It's kind of like Isaac is God's joke on us in our old age. Now, some of you have experienced that, haven't you? Later in life, you know, 14, 15 years after your kids, and all of a sudden, whoop, how did this happen? And a baby comes along. But here's, here's Isaac. And Isaac is, is 100, Abraham's 100 years old when Isaac is born. And, and when Isaac, and, and he had a long adolescent period, but he got married when he was 40. I mean, it was 40 years old, finally meets the woman of his dreams who's a family member, a relative from distant land. Rebecca comes into his life, and, and they get married. And he waits. Because he remembers that God told Abraham that his descendants were going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he was his descendant. And so God, okay, God, what's your plan? I'm in this thing for, for the long run. I'm, I'm waiting. Twenty years after Isaac marries Rebekah, they still don't have any kids. I mean, how long do you wait? How, God, I know you've got a plan here. I know you've got some things going on. I, I know that some things are happening. But, but, but what? What's happening? And at this time, husbands could divorce their wives for a variety of reasons, but one of the major reasons was infertility. Because Having a son to pass on the family lineage was of key importance. But Isaac was a real man. He didn't do that. He loved his wife. He stayed with his wife, and he believed God. And, and it was so difficult that he, he literally takes a stand for his wife. And in Genesis chapter 25, Isaac goes before God. And the Scripture says this, Isaac pleaded that's a key word, pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. He, he pleaded with the Lord. And, and, I, and I thought, as I read that passage, I'm reading through Genesis, and I'm, I, I get stuck right here, and I'm going, can I do that? Could, could I, for my wife or for my kids or, or for my family or my friends, could I, could I wait and pray for 20 years could, could I intercede for them? Could I, could I ask God for, for a breakthrough? And, and then have I done that? Have I prayed for somebody for 20 years or even 20 months or, or 20 days or 20 hours or even 20 minutes? Could I do that? Have I done that? The key verse that we've been looking at in this series is out of Luke chapter 11 in verses 9 and 10, and, and it says this, Jesus is talking to his followers. They asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he teaches them the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he teaches that prayer, and then he goes on to say, let me explain how this works. So he says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. 
For everyone who seeks, finds. Or everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus is saying that prayer has three parts. Ask, seek, and, and knock. And, and I like the asking part. I mean, I really do. I like the asking part. I like to say, God, I need this. I need this. Can you help me here? Can you do this for me? Can you make this come about? I like the asking part. And you know what I really like? I really like the receiving part. I really like it when, when God says, here you are, or this happens, and it works out just perfect. I like the asking and, and receiving part. You know, I, I really even like the seeking part. I like getting alone with God. I like taking my Bible and my notepad, and, and I like going out someplace. Maybe it's, it's just parked in the car or going out to the lake or, or going into a back room of the house and just spending time with God and seeking God and God coming near. But to be honest with you, the knocking part is really frustrating. The knocking part is, is pretty tough. Are, are you there, God? Are you, are you listening to me? And he says, this is a promise. Ask, seek, and, and knock. You know, I look at the story of Isaac, and I, and I get some questions that go through my mind. I, I mean, if, if God was, was for Isaac, and God had a plan for Isaac, why was Rebekah barren? If God intended to bless their family with kids, why did Isaac have to go to him and beg? Why did Isaac have to plead for it? If that's what God's will was, and God was going to do it, and in time it was going to happen, maybe even 100 years old, why does Isaac have to plead? Why does he have to, to knock? And then I wonder this, <clears throat> what would have happened if Isaac wouldn't have pleaded? Would God have done it anyway? Or would have just kind of everything stopped? right there. Would it have changed the outcome of the story if he never would have pleaded? The bottom line is this, is, is Isaac never gave up knocking. He, he never gave up. He, he believed in God. And you look at the second part of that verse that I read, and it says, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant. Not with just one, but with two. It was a double blessing. And so how do you knock? How do you, how do you intercede for somebody else, a family member, a friend, a, a person that's close to you, or maybe just somebody that you've, you've heard of? How do we see breakthrough in our lives or somebody else's life? Today we learn from Isaac how to knock and keep on knocking, and how to knock on heaven's doors on the behalf of others to get breakthrough in their life, to get victory. And, 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 and we look at Genesis 25, and there's three phrases that are used in this passage that I believe have great application to our life. So if we're going to if we're gonna pray for others and get breakthrough, and they're going to they're gonna get their prayers answered, there's several things that we have to do. And on your outline, I've listed these out. These are simple, but they're so powerful. The first is this, is my prayer for others should be passionate. My prayer for others should be passionate. The Bible says Isaac pleaded with the Lord, pleaded. Was that, is that passionate? Was that, is that passionate? Banging on it, is that, is that passionate? Well, yeah, that's kind of what he's talking about. It's passionate is where I'm putting myself into it, and I'm, I'm diving into it, and I'm seeking God, and, and that's what Isaac's doing. He's knocking on heaven's door. He's pleading. Isaac pleaded on behalf of his wife. He didn't just ask. He didn't just throw in the request and say, God, if you get around to it, this is kind of what I, I'd like to say. He begged God to show up. He begged God to intervene. He, he pleaded with him. He knocked on the door. And when you pray for others, are you as passionate about praying for them as you are praying for yourself? Are, are you as passionate about praying for those people in need as you are when you have a big need? Here's Isaac. Knocking is when you raise your voice to God. Knocking is, is when you plead and you cry out to God. So what does pleading mean? I don't think it means whining. 
I, I, don't, I don't think it means just, just, just whining and complaining to God like a three-year-old. Wanting something you need or maybe wanting something that you shouldn't have, but, but you're just going to whine and, uh, because somebody else has it and you're upset about it. I'm, I'm kind of familiar with whining. You know, we've had a preschool here at our church since we've opened at our new facility. We had a preschool in our church in El Paso and California where I was. Um, I've got a number of nieces and nephews and got a little grandchild and I've been around people and I've been in the church for a number of years. I'm very familiar with whining. And I've learned some techniques about, about whining. I, you know, one technique is, is I can ignore it. I can just act like it's not even there. I, I, you, you whine to me and I just kind of go on. I just do what I need to do. You don't even exist. I just move on. And, and so when those little kids whine or something, I just, it doesn't bother me whatsoever. Other times, I, I try to communicate with them and say, now, if you want to have a conversation with me, you're not going to get it by whining. We're, you're going to have to change your tactics here, and we're going to have to talk in a different level, but this whining thing is not going to communicate here. Or the third way I've discovered to deal with whining is just to whine back. You know, just, well, wow, 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 and just whine right back to them. And, and what happens is they get mad usually, and they leave, and you go, whoop, problem solved. <laughs> it's over. I don't have to mess with that anymore. You know, I think when God responds to us, I think there are times when we're, we're good at that, aren't we? We're good at whining. I grew up with the song, why me, Lord, what have I ever done? To deserve even one. You know, and, and we're whiners. We are. And I think God sometimes just, he just kind of, did you, did you say something? You know, we just, he just ignores us. I think God sometimes do that. I think, I think God sometimes comes in and says, now, if you're really going to communicate with me, you're going to have to change your language here. You're going to have to get over the pity party. You're going to have to go, oh, it's all about me and all my problems. And God just kind of gets over it. I don't think God winds back with us. I don't think he does that. But, but I think what's happening here is, is we, can be, we can be whiners. And, and pleading is not whining. Pleading is when your heart is touched by something that it's literally broken over something, that, that you're you're crying over it, you're weeping over it, you're burdened over it, that, that you just can't get away from it. Pleading is saying to God, God in my heart, I, I just can't let this go. This is so vital. This is that, that God, I don't see any other option but you breaking in here and you giving help. That God, I know you have a, a breakthrough designed here and I'm just praying until it comes. That we've got to have this. I, I need this or we need this for my friend or my family or my relationship or my spouse. Or... And Isaac pleaded with the Lord. And if you're going to intercede with family and friends and you're going to pray for others, there's a, there's a key thing that you're going to have to be is you're going to have to be passionate about it. The question is, well, why doesn't God answer all of our prayers? Why doesn't God answer right away sometimes? Why do we have to keep knocking and waiting I think two quick reasons is this, is that knocking forces us to clarify our requests. It, it forces us to cut through the, the, the fat here, and we get down, we cut off the peripheral, and, and we get down to what the essence is and the real issues are. And, and sometimes it's, the request is not the first thing we ask. We, we finally dig down deep enough to deal with what's really happening in our lives. And I think the second reason we keep knocking is that it builds our faith. That God says, I, I want you to trust in me. That even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear because I'm with you. And, and so we develop faith. And James chapter 1 says this, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. First thing we have to do is be passionate when we're praying for others. Second thing the Scripture tells us that if we're going to pray for others is that it must be personal. It, it must be personal. Isaac pleaded with the Lord, catch this phrase, on behalf of his wife. 
He wanted his wife to be whole. He, he knew that her heart was broken. He knew that, that he wasn't praying for himself. He wasn't going to God and saying, God, you know, I'm the, do you remember, I'm, I'm Abraham's son. I'm the child of the promise. And God, it's a little embarrassing when I'm with my friends and, and I'm telling them that, that I've got all these blessings and all these wonderful things coming down the pike and, and nothing's happening, God. And, and I'm just kind of embarrassed, not only for me, but for you a little bit. And, and, and I just need something to happen here. Isaac's not praying for himself. Isaac says, God, I, my wife is heartbroken. My, my wife is, is around other people and, and, and I know that, that God, you're at work here, but, but my wife. And I'm coming to you on her behalf. I can't stand to see her hurt like this anymore. You know, the truth is we live in a broken world. We live in a world where people hurt and they, they agonize and they, they go through heartbreak. I think of just the prayer request that I've received this week and we've sent them out on their Google group and I sent some out even this morning. Evelyn Montag went to be with the Lord this week. And so services tomorrow in Van Buren. And, and we're praying for the Ross family and for the extended family. But sweet lady in her 80s and had a long full life and she is ready to go. I think about others today. Uh, John Foley, who suffered from bacterial meningitis and was air flighted to Tulsa and has been on life support and the family, and their needs, and all that's happening there. Got word yesterday afternoon that Debbie Alexander, who used to be part of our church, who started our caravan program, passed away yesterday afternoon from acute pneumonia. Been in the hospital for several days in Jackson, Tennessee, and just couldn't take it anymore, and her body went to be with the Lord. It just gave up the ghost. And it was, it was tough. I, I think of Bob Cowan, Molly Cook is here today, and her father uh, passed away this week after a long illness battle, very struggling time for the family, and they were all there gathered. It was a tough time. I, I think of Shelly Nugent, a little 20-year-old nursery worker that we have in the hospital, and I sent out this morning that she's supposed to have surgery tomorrow, but they moved it up, and so she's having surgery right now to remove a blood clot from her hand. And she had H1N1, she had pneumonia, and she had a strep infection in her blood. I mean, you can't add much more onto that. And they're just needs. There's great needs. And you think, wow. But that's the world in which we live in. And, and I've been told as a pastor, I remember years ago listening to Eugene Peterson, and he, and he was asked one time, what is, what is a pastor really to do? What is a pastor really about? And he's the author of The Message and a number of other uh, significant books in the Christian faith. And he said, well, the job of a pastor is to teach people how to pray. How to live in and out of God's Word and how to die well. That's it? That's it. Well, I can understand the praying thing and understanding God's Word, but dying well? Well, yeah, because all of us are going to die. So we don't have to be afraid of that. We need to trust God in that. And God has a purpose and a plan even in that. So we don't have to just have all of our prayer requests about that because God has a purpose and we can trust in Him. But to pray, to know His Word, and when we leave this life, we leave in His glory and to His glory. Knocking and asking. And here is... Isaac pleading for his wife, pleading for, for her needs. And, and we know those people that are pleading for physical help. And, and we had a number of people going into surgery this week and next week. We got a number of people that are home ill today with the flu. It's running rapid. So be sensitive to that and wash your hands and cover your mouth and whatever you've got to do. Uh, be sensitive. There's a, lot of, there's, there's a number of people that are really struggling financially with the markets and what's going on with health care and, and what's going on in their own retirements. The number of people are struggling emotionally because of just some, maybe some imbalances that they have or, or more than anything, heartbreak that they've experienced even as a child that's coming back to them as adults. And then there's people that are, 
that are struggling and praying for a breakthrough in their spiritual walk with God. That they would have a relationship with God because when they do, it affects every other area of their life. And, 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 and we need to pray for them. And you know those people. You know those needs. Maybe you're a teacher at a school and you, you deal with kids and you, you see the kind of home they come from. You see the kind of situation that they're in and influences in their life. And you say, oh God, help them. God, work in their life and give them some, a purity of heart and a purity of mind because they're growing up in the cesspool of sin. Maybe you're a, your heart's broken over a loved one or a neighbor or, or a family member, a co-worker who's far from God. And, 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 and the issue is not their position in the company or their production ability. The issue is that they have a soul and that they need breakthrough. Because God wants to do a work in their life. And so Isaac prays for Rebecca that she be made whole. And it's, and it's interesting that commentators, when you pull out the commentaries and you begin to read what scholars say as they study the, the Hebrew and they study the, the context in which the scripture is written in, a number of commentator, commentators add in a few little statements. They add in a phrase that, that they feel like Isaac didn't just pray by himself for Rebecca. But Isaac prayed for Rebecca with Rebecca. That, that she was there, that she was a part of this. And almost every commentary says that, that Isaac was, was probably praying with her. It's good to pray by yourself, to pray while you're in the car, or pray in a private room at home, or to get alone by yourself out in nature, but to spend time in prayer and seek God. But there's something powerful about praying with somebody else about meeting with them. And, and, and commentators say she was there. God, this is my wife. She's right here. God, her heart's broken, and I'm bringing her before you. God, I, I'm, I'm pleading on her behalf. Now, those of us that are married know that in marriage, we go through a lot of different stages. We go through stages where we can do well with each other, and then some stages we don't do so well with each other. And sometimes it's just hard to, to pray together. But when we get to that place, when we move past our own interests and our own needs and we begin to see the needs of our spouse and we pray for them and with them, that all of a sudden God opens up this whole new area of, of ministry and, and, and positions of power in prayer. And I think that's what 1 Peter chapter 3 says when, when Peter talks about husbands and wives. He says this, husbands must give honor to their wives. Treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, and he's talking about physical issues here, physical strength. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you, as you should so that your prayers will not be hindered. Did you capture that last bit? Treat your spouse as you should so your prayers won't be hindered. And, and here's Rebecca. She's at a broken place. She's seeking God. There's, there's a brokenness in her life. And, 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 and I could see her going, I don't even want to talk about it. This is such a wound for me. I don't want to, I don't want to be around people with children. I don't want to talk about it. Isaac, and, and it may have even put up a barrier between her and Isaac. And so for them to be able to pray together. You know, sometimes we're in a relationship and we go, well, I've moved past this. Can't you move past it? Maybe it's a miscarriage, or maybe it was an act that happened, or a, or a hurt that you experienced, and we go, well, I'm over that. How come you're not over it? But to be able to be with a person and pray with them and pray with them through the issue, knowing that different people, it takes different time, and all of a sudden, you realize that you're honoring them. If it's a spouse or a friend or a coworker, you're not pushing them. You're in this thing together. And I wonder if there isn't Something pretty amazing going on here. When I think about Rebecca praying together, and, and there's something significant about praying in a special place. And I began to dream and just kind of speculate on this passage because there's speculation among different commentators on this, uh, commentaries, and, and, and there's speculation that, that Isaac, when he's praying this for Rebecca, took Rebecca to Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah is the mountain of sacrifice, and, and Isaac remembered it well. 
because it was a moment in his life that everything changed. He was the child of the promise. He was the one born to Abraham when he was 100 years old. And, and now he's, he's 60 years old. His wife is still not pregnant, but he remembers that promise. And he takes Rebecca, perhaps, back to Moriah. And he said, this is where it happened. This is where my dad and I went up there. And I was a boy, and I was carrying the wood, and my dad was carrying the fire. And, and I got there. We got to the top of the mountain, and, and I said, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And he said, the Lord will provide And we built this altar and we put the wood out. And when we finished it, my dad came over to me and he started tying me up. And he picked me up and he put me on top of the wood. And he prepared to sacrifice me. I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't even imagine. my I I, I couldn't say a word because he said God would provide and and he's going to sacrifice me. And I can't imagine what was going through Abraham's mind as he was looking at this. God, this was the child you gave me to carry on all that you've promised. And now you want me to give him back to you? If that's what you want, that's what I'll do. And he lifts up the knife to sacrifice Isaac and the angel says, no, stop. Now that I've seen your heart that you would even give up the child of promise, stop and pull back. And he looks over in a bush, and there's a ram that's caught by his horns in the thicket. And he goes over, and he takes that ram back. He unties Isaac, and they sacrifice that ram to God. And then angel comes and says, Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. Abraham, I'm going to bless your descendants, and the entire world would be blessed through you. Genesis chapter uh, chapter 22, the angel says to Isaac, because you obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations on earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Rebecca, that's where the angel stood. That's what the angel was talking about. And Rebecca, when he was talking about the promise, he was talking about us. He was talking about you and me, Rebecca. He was talking about our kids, Rebecca. He was talking about our future and our descendants, Rebecca. Don't you be discouraged. Don't you give up hope because God is a breakthrough. You hang in there. Rebecca, let's just go before God right now. God, I plead with you on behalf of my wife. She has not been able to bear a child. And I plead with you. And God answered the prayer. They came together in a special place perhaps and and they prayed and God answered it. And, And Isaac had faith because he had been through the fire. Maybe there's a place you should take someone or a time when you should approach God on somebody's behalf, praying and knocking with passion, praying and knocking that's personal, it's for that person. And then the third one is this. When I'm praying for somebody and I'm pleading, it needs to be specific. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. Isaac knew exactly what he wanted God to do. Sometimes the problems with our prayers is they are so vague that I wonder if God even knows what we're asking. God, would you just bless them? Have you ever prayed that? God, would you just help me? God, God you know, I, I need an answer. Okay. <laughs> you know, how do you want me to bless? How do you, how do you want me to help? How, at, sometimes you read The Bible and the real blessings are disguised as trouble. And God brings trouble in our life and we go, I'm not going to pray for that anymore. But God says, I have something for you. Be specific. Sometimes our prayers are so general, how can can God answer them? Whatever that need to be specific and to seek God. And, And you think, well, what if God doesn't answer that prayer? What if Isaac began to pray that prayer right after they were married? God, my my wife is burdened, and I'm burdened, and we're just praying for a breakthrough here. No answer. 
So he says, well, forget that, God. I'm not going to follow you. If you're not going to take care of me, I'm going to go follow somebody else who will meet my need. No, Isaac doesn't do that. Isaac just keeps on knocking because he knows what the promise is. He knows that God is at work here, and after 20 years, God breaks in and blesses him. Who is it that God has laid upon your heart that you need to pray for? Who is it that you need to be passionate about in prayer? Who is it that you need to be personal in prayer? Who is it that you need to pray specifically for a particular area? On the bottom of your outline, there's a, there's a little f- two blanks left to fill in. It says, I will plead to the Lord on behalf of the name of a person because or for. This is what I'm asking. This is what I'm pleading for. This is what I'm asking for. And, and I'm going to wrap up the, the message today in a, in a unique way that we've not done before in a while. And we're going to actually put into practice what we've been talking about these last several weeks of asking, seeking, and, and knocking. And in a, in a moment, we're going to have several of our pastors come forward and stand behind the altars. And And I'm going to ask Debbie Hobbs and her family to come forward right now, if you would. Debbie is an Arkansas State uh, legislator in the House of Representatives. She has since God called her and give her the direction to run for the Republican nominee for governor for the state of Arkansas. And she came to me sometime back and just said, Pastor, would would you pray for us? Would you anoint us? Would you anoint me? Because I want God's will in my life more than anything. And I'm just, I'm just asking God to lead and direct if it be in that role or if it be in something else. And I'm going, by all means, I want to do that. And I'm going to pray for Debbie. Debbie, go ahead and come on up here. I'm going to pray for her and anoint her with oil. And after I pray for her, our pastors are going to go ahead and come in place. Go ahead and come right now, would you? And stand right behind these altars. That they are going to have anointing oil with them. And today God has put a burden upon your heart. Or you've had a burden you've been carrying for weeks and months. Maybe even years. And you need prayer today. And these different people are going to come and be here. And they're going to lead you in prayer They're going to pray for your anointing. They're going to pray for blessing. They're going to pray for breakthrough because you're passionate, because it's personal, because you know who it's about and you know it's specific. God, here's my prayer. Here's what I'm asking for. I'm not just asking in a general way. I'm asking in a specific way. Fathers, we come today. We come to this time in the service when we respond to your word. And there's some here today that that need to respond by giving their life to you, by asking for your forgiveness because you are the Savior. You are God. And, And Jesus, you came to earth to show us what it was like to have a relationship with God. And you gave your life that we can be in a relationship with you. Today, we declare you are Lord and Savior. We believe in you. And we want to live our lives to you. And there's some today that need to come and just give their hearts and lives to you and live as a Christian, in relationship, not in a religion, but in a relationship with the Lord and Savior of the world. There's others today that have burdens upon their heart, God. They're carrying great, heavy weights, and they're praying for breakthrough. Could be physically, could be financially, could be relationally, could be spiritually or emotionally. Whatever that area, we're going to be passionate about seeking you. We're going to be be personal about about seeking your will and asking for your help. And we're we're going to keep on knocking by being specific about our prayer. This morning, we have the privilege, Father, of praying for Debbie and her family. We thank you, Lord, for the call you've placed upon her heart to serve us in this civil position. We need people. We need people of influence. We need Christians in government. We need people leading the the way, the charge, lifting up righteousness and morality and truth. So much of what we've experienced today is because we have people aren't doing that. And today we lift up Debbie to you. 
And we thank you for her life and her witness. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen her in body and soul and spirit. That you would anoint her for your service. And Lord, we pray for your victory and your grace in her life. And we anoint her in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for your purpose and your plan. Lord, we want you to use her and she wants to be used by you. She wants to be your faithful servant and she is. And so continue to show her the way and empower her. We pray your full blessing upon her to give her wisdom and decision making, to give her clarity of thought and focus on purpose. And more than anything, to discern your will and your purpose in her life and for those that she leads. Thank you for her family. May you strengthen and help them through this whole process because it's a challenging process. Give them your blessing and your help and your provision. Thank you for Debbie. And once again, we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Bless the Lord, like oh my soul.